Hi everybody and welcome to this new episode of My Journey to a Consultancy Offer. Today we are thrilled to be joined by Sophia Aurora and she will be talking through her journey. Sophia graduated in History and Politics from Fitzwilliam College in 2021 and she's going to talk us through her internship and the offer that she received as well as all of the fantastic work that she has done as a trustee and co-founder of Camstar and then moving on as the co-founder of Swap. Before she even and starts her new role uh, with McKinsey and company in the London office. So first of all, a huge welcome to you, Sophia, and thank you for being with us. Hi, Emily. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You're so welcome. And we are so pleased to have you at this time before you get super busy. <laughs> um, not that you haven't been busy in your entire time um, at Cambridge. And um, so if uh, anybody is unfamiliar with this series, what we do is we talk through people's consultancy offers and the journeys that they took to get there. Because as we know, there's lots of different types of consultancy, but also that it's quite an unusual process, uh, different to other jobs that you go to and takes a little bit of work to get there. So that's what we're going to talk through. And there'll be lots of hints and tips from somebody who has lived through it. Um, If you haven't met me before, my name is Emily Packer and I'm a careers consultant for the University of Cambridge, specialising in consultancy, entrepreneurship and banking and financial markets. So without further ado, let's go into kind of the basics. Um, We know where you graduated from, but could you just tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. So I did history and politics, um, graduated in June last year, went to Fitzwilliam College. I was president of the Cambridge University Consulting Society when I was at university and I did the summer intern, got the summer internship at McKinsey. And like you said, I'm starting next week. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So you just mentioned a little bit there about that you were um, applying for roles and you managed to get your internship. So how did you approach researching the firms that you were going to actually apply to? Or did you have a really clear idea in mind? I definitely did not have a clear idea in mind. So originally, when I started second year, I wanted to do finance and I was applying to investment banking and looking back now I think that was me following the crowd it was the herd effect um I did do the JP Morgan spring week in first year uh, the finance for non-finance which if you haven't come across it yet and you're a humanity student like me definitely look it up because it is a really good way just to get exposed to that industry coming from a non-financial background Um, but following that I then applied to IBD Um, I successfully got offers from Goldman Sachs and Perella Weinberg and BNP Paribas for summer internships, was set to go to Goldman, but basically had a complete pivot and thought, no, finance is not for me. Um, Coming back to the question of how I even went from the research stage of applying to then getting Goldman to then switching into consulting and going to McKinsey, I think for me, I can remember three key stages of what I went through I think the first stage was me going to the Cambridge Career Fairs and basically um, this first stage involved me just making a big excel sheet and writing down every firm that I wanted to apply to and the best way to do that is to get the brochure that the Cambridge services Cambridge Career Service gives you and look at all the firms look at the ones that stand out to you the ones that you want to apply to check whether they're rolling basis write down their deadlines write down any requirements they have on your excel sheet um, any um, things such as cover letter required all those little details are important to put in one place um, and then basically just start sending out your applications go through that excel sheet and I think it's important to remember that in this stage for me anyway 90% will lead to rejection Um, I think it's so easy when you hear people on this podcast who do have a bit of a survive, you get a bit of a survivorship bias. We've managed to get our dream offer, but let's not forget that before that, uh, we also went through tons of rejections and that's completely normal. And if you weren't getting rejections, you'd be having tons of interviews, which is pretty much impossible to do when you're studying at Cambridge. So um, yeah, it's completely normal to get rejected. And then next stage is the interview stage and I think that part is really important when it comes to researching because you need to remember that not only are they seeing if they want you but you're also seeing if you want them Mm -hmm. and um, this is also important because as you get offers from your interview you can cut down 
companies that you no longer want to apply to. So for example, after I got Perella Weinberg, I stopped applying to lots of other boutiques because I thought realistically I wouldn't take it over Perella Weinberg and that will save you a lot of time. So these um, tactics are really important to do to save time because the application process is overwhelming. And if you don't, um, don't feel obliged to go to interviews and, and save the, save the um, interviewer's time as well. If you're not going to take the job, don't, don't go. Um, so that was the second stage. And then the final stage is if you do get offers, like I said, and you don't know where to go, um, how do you research and figure out which place is for you? Um, and I think that's like, I, like when I said the interview stage was really important because I got a really good idea of the cultures of the firms that I interviewed at and decided that some of them were just not for me. I, I actually just discovered that finance from my experience in the interviews was not an industry I'd be happy in. Um, which is what led me to apply to MBB instead. Um, so yeah, your AC day is a really important, um, it's a really important part of the process in terms of your final decision of where to go. Um, if you don't manage to get a good idea, then researching is best done by reaching out on LinkedIn to people, going for coffee charts, um, speaking to people in more informal settings, because then you can ask questions like, what's the work-life balance? What's the progression like after a couple of years? Um, so yeah, I think that was some of my process and how I went about researching the different places. I think that's brilliant, Spirit. And I think that what you've articulated really well there is that you, the, you know, the interviews are not just for, for them to find out if you're the right person, which can really feel like when you're under that pressure to get a role, but also that you can learn a lot from an interview yourself. And that's why asking questions at interviews is really important. But the other thing that you've articulated really well and that is really important is that you don't have to wait for a formal application process to understand things like culture and whether an industry is right for you. Because actually, you know, it might take a little bit of time, but you might find somebody that is willing to have a coffee with you or just a 10 minute chat about how they find just working there. So you know, not a day in the life and not the kind of <laughs> tasks they do, but how they feel working there, you know, um, and, you know, kind of, do they have peers there and, you know, what's the work-life balance like and, you know, how do they feel motivated? So, you know, you've, you've picked up quite a range of ways that you can research rather than just websites and recruitment um, fairs. But it kind yeah, of takes... it's funny you say that actually because sorry to no, cut no. you off, but you just took me back to um one of the greatest things about Cambridge is that network and of people that you get to be on campus with. And I actually got my PM BNP Paribas interview from sitting at dinner next to a recruiter at a Cambridge event, which is caveat a huge privilege that we be we're able to um have those dinners and go to those networking events. But yeah, if you're lucky enough to to access them, then go and the best way to get to know a culture of a firm is through those um particularly the boutique networking events because I think for finance more so than consulting networking really does impact your success in the interview and even get you an interview for um boutique firms they will remember you I think for consulting networking wasn't really a thing it's more formal but for um financial boutiques it's really important and yeah, it's definitely a privilege to have those opportunities, but you have to take them. So, you know, you you put yourself in the seat next to that person, right? So it's also about taking that initiative and not just kind of sitting behind the stuff that's so easily accessible, like websites and, you know, talks and things and actually really kind of taking yourself out there. Um, and if you don't have the networks, just try and build them. So there's nothing to stop people running their own events or yeah. you know and things like that and I know you'll know that well from your work in the societies and things which we'll talk about so you've mentioned a couple of things about research there in general what's your top recommendation for practical resources that candidates should access across the whole process so tools and things that they could access that actually helped you prepare yeah so I've actually written this one down because um it's been a while and I forgot sure. so um I remember I went to a BCG networking event with my CV in hand printed and I just gave my CV to someone who worked at BCG at the event. I was like, please can you give me some feedback? And they just got a pen and just annotated my CV. And that was a Cambridge BCG event. So again, those events are really important um, and really helpful as a practical resource to get feedback on your CV. The amount of LinkedIn messages I get saying, can you look at my CV? 
Honestly, online, you're probably not going to catch me in the time. But if you literally just print off your CV and take it to someone, it takes five minutes for them to say, don't say this, maybe say that, bring this out more. Um, so that's a great resource. The other one that I swear by for case interviews is Case Coach, which you can get free access to by Cambridge Careers. Um, I probably would not have got my McKinsey offer without uh, Case Coach. It was so tailored exactly to the McKinsey process as well. Um, so that's a really good resource. The other resource is your peers. So um, again, like you're on, when you're um, lucky enough to be on a campus like Cambridge with so many people that are applying and alumni as well who have successfully made it through the process, use them to practice your interview, your case interviews, practice with other people that are applying. So me and a friend would do case practice every morning in the week before the interviews that we had coming up. Um, and so I think really tap into the, the brains of the people around you. Um, the other resource that I used was Victor Cheng, Look Over My Shoulder, and that's a podcast. For me, that was really important in increasing my confidence in terms of how to hold myself in a case interview. I actually only came across the podcast a couple of days before my BCG interviews. And what I would do is I would put it on whilst like brushing my teeth and basically try to in my head, learn the language of the people in the interview so that I could literally imitate it and almost method act my way through the interview by pretending I was on Victor Cheng's podcast. And it's just a really good way to learn the lingo, get to know what sort of questions are going to come up, learn how to hold yourself. Again, it's a free resource. I think when it comes to practical resources, it's overwhelming how much there is on the internet and how much money as well people are sometimes asking you to pay. There's coaches, there's so many subscriptions you can buy. Um, and that's, for me, like that's not fair. And I don't think you, it's necessary to apply to um, pay for a lot of these resources, um, especially when you do have a career service that is normally offering it for free. And if not, they'll have something equivalent that's basically the same for free. So definitely tap into your career service before you commit to spending a ridiculous amount on an interview. I really appreciate the way you were talking about that embodying experience of like listening to podcasts and things, but actually embodying it because when you're going through an interview process, particularly one that has multiple stages or that is fitted to a particular industry like consulting, you do have to put yourself in the shoes of a consultant and to perform that way not to not be yourself and you do all of the research but there's also that sort of armor you put on isn't there where you yeah. you have to embody that and that takes some time so as you said you know doing the practice can really help and you know learning kind of some of the language and the and then the way that people are talking is key so um that can be really really helpful and you're also you know really encouraging to hear about the fact that you know, peers and people within your network, um, you know, re can really help and support you to practice and things. And, you know, there's so much resource out there and support that you don't, you know, you don't have to pay for it. There's, there's very, there's very little out there you pay for that you can't get for free if you're, if you're using the right kind of correct networks in your career service. So it's really good to hear about just the variety of ways of practical resources that you tapped into and how creative you were. I think the key thing as well I'd like to ask you is about there's so much to do when you're applying to consulting from researching the firm to writing the application to preparing for multiple rounds of case interviews. Were there any details that you particularly paid attention to when applying? Were there things that you particularly knew that you had to get right in your applications that you spent time on? Yes. So I cannot, if there's one thing anyone listening takes away from this podcast, it is the personal fit is so important and people really overlook that. I was planning to wing my personal fit for McKinsey. I thought I can talk about myself. That's the easy part. I just need to get through the case. Personal fit is the 50% of what will make your interview successful. And it is not something you can wing. You really need to practice because for McKinsey, it's so specific. They will ask you one question and you just give one answer. It has to be about a two minute answer, detailed story. And then they will drill you on that story you've given about a case or not a, case, a, con, a situation you've been in or um, an example you've worked in a team. And they will drill you on that one example you give. And that requires practice and that requires not not um bluffing your way 
you're through something. It requires really knowing the way you felt in a certain situation, how you dealt with it, um, a step-by-step process by the hour of how you fixed a certain problem. Um, so definitely use Case Coach to get a template of the personal fit answer. Watch the Case Coach videos on people answering personal fit questions and then practice doing that yourself. Don't, don't leave that to the last minute. Really good advice around that fit interview because I think people get so, I think probably 90% of people come to me and ask me about the practical questions, the, you know, the more business focused analytical case questions and actually firms are also hiring a person that they want to work with and a person that fits to the firm that's going to be able to carry forward their mission statement and agenda Um, Mm -hmm. it's also like you said right at the beginning a really good way to see if you're going to fit into the firm too yeah Yeah. I also think that if you've made it to the final round they know that you can do a case they know that you can solve a problem the final round is about you as a person and what will when it comes down to picking between you and someone else the personal fit will be the deciding factor yeah So aside from the fit interview, were there any other particular parts of your preparation for the recruitment process that you thought were going to be a real challenge and had to kind of maybe do a bit more planning to overcome them? Um, I think for me, a lot of it was confidence. Um, Second year is early when you're applying for internships you're still I feel like I was still young I was 19 I did not think I would be having to hold myself so professionally in these situations and um, so for me working on body language and how I spoke and gaining confidence was really important I remember I actually did a mock interview I think it was with you Emily um, or your colleague and we get videoed and you well you videoed us yes, um, yeah. And we can then play it back and see our body language and realize things that where we come come across hesitant. Um, So definitely take advantage of that. I think that's something really important to do, get advice on how you hold yourself in an interview because that will go a long way. Um, The other thing I struggled with is it'd been a couple of years since I did mental maths. So I remember in the couple of days before my interview, I just focused on maths drills and Again, I should get paid by Case Coach for the amount of advertising I do for them. But they they offer um, in the package that Cambridge pays for, they offer math drills that take about five minutes every morning and you, you just do a quick mental math test. And that, that really helped me just speed up my maths. Yeah, and some of great advice. Um, and Guren, who founded Case Coach, actually gave once when I watched one of his case workshops was just when you're queuing for a coffee just add up the coffee board so that you're just constantly yeah. doing maths all the time um, or like figure out how you can make the queue work quick more quickly. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to be sitting down doing loads of maths all the time, does it? Like you just said, five minutes every morning, you know, just doing a lot of like, market sizing as well. Literally, it comes up more than you realize in just social social situations, and you find yourself in your head doing a market sizing of how many <laughs> drinks are at this house party. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it doesn't all have to be lock yourself away. It can be whilst you're on the go. And you mentioned about listening to podcasts whilst you were kind of getting ready in the morning. You know, walk, walks to college, walks between lectures you know, on the bus to see someone, you know, it, it can be fit, fit, fit in. Um, did you did you come across any really unexpected experiences when you're going through the application process? Anything that came up and you were like, I did not expect that? Um, I think I didn't expect creativity to be so valued in cor- corporate culture. So like I said, I was nervous about the maths and the very technical aspect of things. Um, what I wasn't doing was playing to my strength enough which was being creative and the entrepreneurial spirit side of things and that I think is what McKinsey saw is that I am someone who loves being creative loves coming up with ideas to solve solutions so really play to that strength I didn't realize it would be such a strength when I was applying and now looking back I can see why it's so important so if you are someone who may not be so good at at maths or know how to do certain evaluations of a company maybe you're really creative and play to that and make sure that comes across in the interview and I think it's worth us reiterating, you're not from a STEM degree, you know, you're not from science and maths or technology or engineering, you know, and that's 
something that really people get hung up on is they won't be valued because they don't have a numerical background. But actually, there's so much that makes up a consultant, isn't there? And I think what's reassuring about this as well is there's so many books by American universities and technical books that you can just sit and read and then you regurgitate structures and you think, okay, I'm just going to learn and revise this for my interview. But that won't really make you successful. And they want to see you think on your feet, almost like in your Cambridge interview, they want to see um, if you can think on the spot. So you don't need to get bogged down into reading lots of technical stuff. You don't, probably won't have time along to side your degree. Um, you just need to practice thinking about business problems and how you would solve them. Yeah. And that does take creativity. Certainly some of, you know, some of the leading kind of businesses are creative and innovative and not just, you know, good at numbers. I'd quite like us to talk just briefly about something that's probably very important to people listening to this, which is you don't just magically end up with an internship at McKinsey. Uh, You don't just get there because you've made a good application. You have to have things to put in that application. And I think part of the journey is actually what you put yourself through at Cambridge, such as your, you know, presidency of the society, can start, you know, even kind of your entrepreneurial spirit now. How, what do you think was the biggest defining experience for you at Cambridge in terms of your extracurriculars that made you think that you had lots to talk about in your interviews and you, and you felt like a good fit? I think it's being a go-getter and being proactive in whatever you do. So they don't value having, they don't care that I've done JP Morgan Spring Week. They care that I started a podcast and that I started a charity because that shows you're proactive. It shows that you take initiative to do things you're interested in. They're not that bothered about the blue chip names. They'd rather see someone who has a genuine passion and wants to make a difference and actually does something about it. Um, rather than someone who's just following, like running on a treadmill, trying to tick certain boxes. And I think that's um, important to realise because it means that you don't have to have had exposure to certain um, networks. People have got into certain places. You just need to be a leader in whatever you do and you don't need to have any certain experience either. I remember the best advice I got from a McKinsey recruiter is that they value startup experience or leadership experience and something you've set up way more than they would value work experience at a big firm that they might have heard the name of because you have got that yourself, you've you've got your own interest and you're your own leader. You're not just running on a treadmill, ticking off boxes and thinking that you have to go to certain places. Like It's all about showing that you have passions and interests and they're employing a diverse group of people. They want people that have different interests. They don't want someone who's molded into consulting because the whole point of consulting is bringing a team of people together that can bring different perspectives, not the same type of people in one room. And with entrepreneurialism or innovation, or even starting a charity there's lots there's two things there which is managing risk because anything you start brand new is risk but secondly you are actually putting yourself on the line you're not hidden behind a big name are you you're actually you know trying to put yourself out there and if something goes wrong or right they're both your responsibility I think that's really important particularly when you're going to go and work with clients because it's very easy to be detached from that process. But if you can understand that they are running a business and they are, um, you know, they're putting themselves on the line, the work you do for them is even more important, isn't it? A lot of people say to me, oh, I can't apply for consulting. I don't have enough experience referring to professional experience. And I always say that's not what they're looking for. If you've if you really care about a certain issue in your community and you're doing something about it, that will speak volumes compared to having got work experience at a certain firm. Yeah, definitely. Um, All right. So um, final couple of questions. And that is, if you had to give maybe two key pieces of advice or key two key messages for others that are looking to secure interviews, what, what would those things be? What would those guiding lights be? um two pieces of advice the first one is be proactive so we've mentioned a few ways you can do that that's through tapping into your peer network through reaching out to people and throwing yourselves out there going to dinners where you will gain exposure to recruiters and get a good sense of the culture but also being proactive in terms of 
you have a passion do and you want to change something about a certain issue in your local community do something about it consultants recruiters love go-getters and proactive people not people that just talk like you need to walk the walk as well um and then the second piece of advice is the confidence thing so if you struggle with confidence then use um the career service to give you advice on how you can improve your body language and the way you speak and also use podcasts to sort of find people that you admire and you aspire to be like and then literally pretend to be them um i think you can fake it till you make it to a degree there where you can sort of method out your way through the interview and pretend that you're a yourself in 10 years time rather than a 19 year old who actually has no clue what's going on <laughs> yeah sure it's good life advice as well <laughs> um, <laughs> it might be obvious then um first we kind of close up but you know you mentioned right at the beginning about following the crowd with finance and i suppose you could easily follow the crowd into McKinsey, Bain, BCG, the, you know, the really large firms. What was it for you that actually made a, a decision above the obvious um, that this was the right firm for you to go with? Yeah, that's a hard question because yeah. um, completely yeah, consulting is also some, a very popular career choice in Cambridge. But for me, um, I studied politics and my passion was in social entrepreneurship and um, and politics as well as business. And that's why consulting stood out to me because I didn't have to pick one or the other. And consulting lets you do a diverse range of work and sort of put off that decision and gain exposure to lots of different industries um, rather than pigeonhole yourself, um, which is something I really didn't want to do at such an early stage in my career. That's um, why McKinsey really stood out because they have, for example, the Public Institute, they have research organisations so that if I did want to go into politics, that's still an option for me, even though I wanted to explore the business side of my interests. Um, so, yeah, I think that's why I'm very excited, but also really lucky that I get to go because I don't have to pick one area. Yeah, I can just keep exposing myself to as much as possible out there. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Any final words for advice, Sophia? My final bit of advice would be if you don't, again, so I'm lucky enough that I did get McKinsey, but if you don't get it, don't see it as be all and end all. This is the very start of our career, not the where we'll be in 20 years and things will change along the way. It's like a lifelong process. And the application process is exactly that. You will learn so much about yourself, mm. um, which is really important. And if you do get rejections, get feedback I think it's really hard at the time to sort of swallow your pride and be like what is what is my weakness why am I not getting the job but you've spent so much time going to those interviews the least you deserve is some feedback on why you didn't get the job really take advantage of that and uh, even ask your interviewers that might have not given you the position if they'll have a quick coffee or a 20 minute phone call where they can just tell you more about how you can improve um I would definitely do that and that would be my final bit of advice Great. Uh, so thank you so much, Sophia, for everything that you've shared. There's some excellent advice in there that could be really useful to people. And we wish you lots of luck as you go into your role and we and also all of your other ventures that you are going yeah. into. Um, for now, we'll say a big thank you to everybody listening and um, not to forget that you can access all of the resources that Sophia has talked about, such as Case Coach. Uh, CV review and CV guide um, through the career service. Um, so just click onto the career service main webpage and you'll see that under help with applications. All right, Sophia, take care. I shall give you a nice wave and uh, good luck and speak soon. Thanks so much. Speak to you soon.